And welcome back. With over two decades of relentless dedication to this cause, our guest, a champion for equal justice, currently serving as a president and CEO of the National Legal Aid and Defender Association, our guest has been at the forefront of shaping policies and initiatives, promoting fairness and equity in legal representation. Joining me now and sharing more is, yes, the president and CEO of the National Legal Aid Defenders Association, April Fraser Kamara. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And so as we talk about the, uh, the association here, I want to talk a little bit about the work that you, that you do, and uh, I've shared a little bit about it, but uh, take us a little bit further behind the scenes. Absolutely. So National Legal Aid and Defender Association, we're over 100 years old, actually 112 years old. The organization was started based on one premise, that all people, when you face civil or criminal court, should have the right to an attorney regardless of your ability to pay. So we've been working for over a century on the issue of access to justice for people who cannot afford representation. So typically those communities, under-resourced communities, are brown and black communities. And so at the heart of what we do, we also focus in on racial equity because we understand without racial justice, there can be no true equal justice. And when we talk about true equal justice, give us the state of where you see things right now. I mean, uh, you know, I know the last guy that was up at the highest office in the United States really has done some things in terms of really polarization, and that's carried out in a lot of places. But from your lens, what are you saying? Yes, so um, for us here at Legal National Legal Aid and Defender Association, on next week, we're going to be celebrating the 61st anniversary of Gideon versus Wainwright, which is the Supreme Court decision that uh, guaranteed the right to counsel in criminal cases. And um, 61 years later, we still see that there is so much work to be done around funding public defense and making sure that not only do people have access to an attorney, but they have access to a good, trained, competent, and well-resourced attorney when they're facing the loss of their liberty in a criminal case. And for those people who are in civil court, we uh, unfortunately, we still don't have a right to counsel for every person who it, are, are dealing with civil issues. And so what we see is that in many cases, 80% of people go unrepresented in civil proceedings in this country. And we know what that means for people who um, don't have resources or may not be educated to understand the system. It means that a lot of people lose housing, lose public benefits, and lose other vital services that they need to take care of themselves and their families. So many, many years later, we find that we have a lot of work to do to realize the true uh, promise of equal justice in America. You know, since COVID uh, has taken place, a lot of people talk about the backlog in the court system. What are you finding by way of the court system? Are you able to necessarily navigate with fluidity or are we finding still there's a backlog and it's kind of like creating some issues for you on the ground? That's a really great question. So we have our members, our civil legal aid attorneys and public defenders who are in courtrooms across the country every single day. And what we hear from our members is that uh, the courts are still uh, facing issues around backlogs. And actually one issue that really relates to that is uh, retention of civil legal aid and public defenders. Many of our organizations post COVID are facing grave challenges on being able to recruit and retain attorneys to do this work. And one of the reasons why there's such a challenge is because the pay for civil legal aid and public defenders in many places are so low that people cannot afford to do the work. And so unfortunately, the issue that we see with the courts and the backlog is directly related to the fact that we have underfunded civil legal aid and public defender offices, and they cannot compete in this job market. Post-COVID, people are um, demanding more um, 
resources and more benefits and many civil legal aid and public defenders cannot um, compete in this job market. But what that means for people who are in court, uh, if you are being held um, in custody, you're at Rikers or here if you're at DC jail, what that means is that how long you have to wait for your trial date is extended. If you're in civil court, what it means is that a proceeding related to the custody of your children or child support is delayed. So we understand that it has real world impacts on the communities that we serve. I know that you've also advocated for an increase in federal funds. Uh, talk to us about that advocacy. Absolutely. So a major part of what we do is advocate on the federal level for increased funding for civil legal aid and public defense. So we are about to kick off our campaign this year for 2024 and 2025 federal budgets. So many people don't know, but on the, on the, for civil legal aid, most of civil legal aid services is funded through a program called the Legal Services Corporation, which is a entity here in Washington, D.C. that administer funds to civil legal aid programs. And every year we have to fight um, not only to keep those funds, but really fight to have an increase to address the years of disparities and the lack of funding that we've seen. In the previous administration, there was a threat uh, by the last White House to eliminate, completely eliminate legal services corporation funding. And we fought. And not only did we win the fight, but we actually received increased funding during that year. And so what we're fighting for this year is to actually see additional increases because we understand that because legal services is so chronically underfunded that there's a great need for us to increase funding for civil legal aid. And equally for public defense, we're fighting for the Equal Defense Act which is a federal piece of legislation to provide support and resources to public defender offices. And that is a fight that we're committed to and we're um, doing every single day here in Washington, D.C. April, when people talk about public defenders, there's this automatic stereotype and connotation sometimes it comes. But the reality is they are so essential uh, in the court system. And I think you pointed out just a few minutes ago of how important it is uh, in a courtroom and to have legal representation and what that can mean in terms of, uh, you know, anything from jail time to civil, the whole nine yards. But can you please walk through some of our viewers the importance of the work that you do? Absolutely. So specifically, I'm a former public defender and I understand uh, some of the community's response to public defense because as you may hear in my voice, I'm a Southern girl and I grew up in Tennessee. And I understand that many systems have been woefully underfunded and the services that communities have received from those systems have been not up to par. So we understand that. And I think it's important for public defenders to reckon with that past. But I also had the uh, fortunate opportunity to attend Howard University in here in Washington, D.C., and actually be exposed to the D.C. Public Defender Service. And that's where I became a public defender. So I saw firsthand what a well-resourced, well-funded, and excellent public defender system uh, looks like. And so for those who um, have had the opportunity to practice in those settings, I can say, you know, without a shadow of, the, of a doubt, if a loved one of mine was accused of a crime here in D.C., I would want them to be represented by the public defender. And that's what we want people to be able to say, regardless of what zip code you're in. And so the role that public defenders play is not only vital to the individual cases that they're representing, but all of, all of our constitutional rights, the rights 
not to be harassed by police, the rights for your, um, the right to remain silent, the right for the government to have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you've committed a crime before your liberty is taken. And those are fundamental rights that are important to all of us. Even if you've never stepped into a courtroom, you want to make sure you have a system that's upholding those values. And that's what public defenders do every single day. Thank you, April. I wanted to get that point out there because I'm sure people are asking the question. Uh, and there's some stereotypes that are associated with it. I really love the fact of how you talked about that, you know, we heard your accent out there. I, you know, I kind of thought you was like Brooklyn or the Bronx, the way you sounded. But, uh, you know, I understand. It's uh, D.C. Got gotcha. you. Thank you for being, thank you for sharing that with us. But I want to talk to you a little bit more about, you know, racial equity here because obviously that's what we need out here. We need equity. It's not just equality, but it's really equity. Um, how do we get to that place of, you know, uh, getting people trained in the area of that? Because that's a lot of work that, that can really mitigate some of the things that we're talking about here. Absolutely. So I think it's very important in, anytime we're talking about um, public defenders, civil legal aid attorneys, people who serve communities of color for you to be properly trained on what the history and what the realities are for people who live in those communities. So at NLADA, when I first became president over two years ago, we launched the Racial Equity Institute, which is focused on training public defenders and civil legal aid attorneys on racial equity issues. And that work is so critically important because a part of being competent and having competent representation is understanding the people who you are standing beside in courtrooms every single day. You have to understand the conditions and the realities that they live in as people of color in America. And we also know that racism is so deeply embedded into our legal system that if you have attorneys who do not understand that history and that relationship, you can actually end up doing more harm than good. Uh, when representing people of color. So we don't, the, the issue of understanding race and racial equity, it is a core competency to providing quality representation, specifically for under-resourced communities. So we think that it is a fundamental part of what it means to be a public defender and civil legal aid attorney. And if people want to find out more information about the organization and the work that you're doing, please, how do you go about doing that? Sure, you can visit our website at www.nlaba.org uh, and learn about our work. And also you can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and uh, we would invite you um, to follow us and we want you to learn about the work. And also um, go visit your local public defender office and civil legal aid office in really understand uh, the, the important work that they do. And when you say the important work that they do, I think it can't be left out there that there's some transformational work that goes on by public defenders. And, um, you know, some people pay for attorneys and some people cannot afford to pay for attorneys. But just because you cannot afford to pay for an attorney does not mean that the attorney cannot do the best job for you either, right? Uh, and so when we see what's happening in our courtrooms and we see uh, the lack of representation, how does it make you feel? I, um, I get up every single day troubled by the fact that um, we do live in a country where justice oftentimes is based on how much money is in your bank account, what, how much justice can you afford. And that should not be true in an equitable, fair, and just legal system. And so I think it is, um, it's a fight that while we have made uh, advancements, we still have a whole lot of work to do, um, specifically around, it's not just about representation. We know that a person can stand next to you, but whether or not you have a true advocate, someone who is going to um, fully represent you, zealously represent you, get, get to know who you are as a person, and understand that you're more than a case number, you're an actual person with a, a, a family and loved ones, that type of representation is what we're fighting for every day. Not 
just uh, the bare bones representation that we see afforded in many systems. So that component is, is really important, not just whether you have access to an attorney, but whether you have quality representation. And that's the important part that we're fighting for. But also let me note that um, a few years ago, about five years ago, we started the Black Public Defenders Association. And we also understand that it's important that for the clients that we serve to see people who look like them providing representation. And so that is also a very key part of what we're doing here, trying to increase diversity in the legal profession, because too often um, people from our community are not afforded the opportunity to become attorneys, to take on these roles, to fight for our community. And we want to see that change as well. We actually, I think it's important for people from our community to be standing side by side um, to clients who look like them. And, and, and that is an important part of um, quality representation as well in advancing equal justice. Well, April Frazier, Kamara, thank you so much for being with us, sharing a lot about that. President CEO of the National Legal Aid and Defender Association. Appreciate having you, and uh, please come back to see us again. Absolutely. Thank you so much for taking time. I appreciate it.